Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Lovely to meet you and thank you for your time. My pleasure. If it's okay to introduce yourself and just talk us through your very interesting background. Sure. Uh, so I'm Andrew Hill. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, and that means I essentially work at the intersection of mind and brain. And unlike many scientists, I'm really focused on the sort of practical application of science in this modern world where you can get information, you can get access to an understanding of what's going on under the covers. You know, many of us are you know, armchair doctors via, you know, dint of Google. And I think the same thing can be applied, you know, biohackers, quantified self, health and wellness. You know, there's a range of, of reasons you may want to intervene in your performance or health. And a lot of my journey has culminated in a place of giving people tools to do so. So to unpack, I guess, a little bit of that journey. I spent some time early on working, a good decade working in acute environments with people with multiple disabilities, cognitive disabilities, physical developmental disabilities, seizures, migraines, no communication. I ran a group home for a couple of years, for about four years, where everyone in there was deaf, blind, and mentally retarded and had other you know, major disabilities uh, where we're doing tactile signs or a method of communication. I worked in acute psychiatric environments with children, elders, people with dual diagnosis, meaning drug and alcohol as well as psychiatric. Name it, and I've done it in terms of health and human services, essentially across populations and across acuity, you know, inpatient, outpatient. And I did this for 15, 20 years and saw a lot of revolving door stuff in healthcare, a lot of symptom management, not a lot of progress, especially in psychiatric and mental health care. It was a lot of agency. You know, people were medicated until they were. Uh, the problems were less uh, obvious, but, you know, working in a psychiatric uh, acute environment, I kept seeing the same people coming through again and again without any real progress. And it was very frustrating. And I got injured. Uh, I was the head of doing hands-on restraints at a hospital and trained people how to do that in a psychiatric acute facility with locked doors and, you know, multiple emergency codes every shift. And I just did too much in the way of physical hands-on with too few staff back to back and ended up injuring my back pretty badly, uh, doing a lift on the, the geriatric floor later on, helping somebody out, taking a rest and doing a lift. And I lose some discs in my lower back and couldn't do the very hands-on work I had been doing at that point as a young person in my 20s and, you know, well, maybe 30s by then. But whatever it was, I was suddenly in the need to shift careers. And so I ended up working in high tech for several years and doing tech evangelism and database modeling and a bunch of other sort of semi-unrelated things that were almost, you know, orthogonal to what I had been doing. And I sort of missed the health and human service stuff a little bit. I was pretty good at working with people and it didn't pay well and it wasn't very glamorous and it was, you know, uh, difficult. And I ended up getting laid off from a tech job, you know, the sort of tech bubble was correcting at this point. And I left tech and went back to work in human services and found an autism center. And they used this thing called neurofeedback that I was aware of. It was this biofeedback technique in the brain. And they did a lot of work with autistic and ADHD and other developmental population people. And I had a huge amount of experience with that population. So they were excited to hire me and have me work with their problem kids and stuff. And then I saw people changing. I saw ADHD going away in a few months. I saw eye contact coming back in autism. I saw seizures dropping away reliably. I saw sensory integration issues going away completely. I saw OCD getting blunted in kids. It was amazing in, in like a few weeks and months. And against my backdrop of, you know, this stuff is chronic and unmanaged, mm. I suddenly was sit, find myself in a position of people moving through problems that were considered in, untractable, uh, in, in, intractable and, and built in. So that kind of got my attention. And after a couple of years of that, I, well, among other things, I went back and got a a PhD, but I was only really able to because I stuck around after hours and trained my brain and got rid of some pretty severe uh, distractibility and impulsivity. So for me, it was a personal experience, both, you know, in terms of how it was, you know, inflection point against previous mental health care. I had a great personal experience with it, using it to just address some interesting, you know, stuff in my own brain. And at the time, this is probably still largely true, there was a few schools of thought in neurofeedback and what I refer to as a blind men and elephant situation. And we all have a little piece of the, of the puzzle and think we understand the truth. You know, somebody has the ear and thinks that they have a, a leaf and the tail, it's a snake, you know, the blind men and the elephant. Um, and we all have a little piece of it. There's these different schools of thought in neurofeedback that come at it from different ideas about what is actually happening, how we're training the brain, what is going on, how you assess the brain. And some of those schools of thought are in, in direct conflict in the underpinning ideas. I mean, dramatic conflict. And yet, they all get results that are rather remarkable. 
I mean, it's kind of crazy to say, but if you sent me 100 ADHD people of all ages, I would reliably turn out, you know, more than 95 people without ADHD three to four months later, um, permanently, and reliably drop seizures by more than 50%, and reliably, you know, pull the teeth of migraine. I, I give free services to veterans for PTSD, and they drop out halfway through my program because they're feeling too good. And they are back on living with their lives and back at work and whatever else they moved on. They don't want to travel across town to the services. So you had to take away here is that I discovered that there was this technique people were using to make massive change in their brain that no one really understood well. And the field is this black art field of doing interesting techniques and learning about them, but it's a mix of therapists with no neuroscience ability and amazing skills and you know, very particular scientists who don't really understand techniques, and there's a whole weird mix of people doing the work, and most of them are therapists doing this in a therapy context or medical context as psychiatrists. And there's probably only about 10,000 people worldwide doing neurofeedback in terms of practitioners. And the vast majority of them are therapists had this therapy model. And I really felt that there needed to be something different, and so I created a company called Peak Brain which is all about giving you access to brain training technology to address whatever you want to address. I don't care what brain you come in with. If you have symptoms, great. If you have goals that are performance driven, great. You know, my job is never to tell people what they want to do with their brain. Like the Equinox, you know, high end gym coach won't tell you, you know, which fitness goal you might walk in with. It might help you shape your goals. If you're like, Oh, I really want abs. You're like, yeah, you should get some abs. But core strength is, you know, probably also important the metaphor, the model of personal trainer, I think fits neurofeedback and biofeedback in the brain a lot better than the metaphor and model of treatment of, of therapist. And so we do some radical things in the industry. We price way down, which is still somewhat expensive because it's lots of hours in the office, lots of technology, but we're roughly half of average in the field in terms of pricing. We do radical things like never charge you for repeat assessments of your brain after the first one. So it's a lifelong you know, window into your brain slowly changing. We teach you to read your brain maps and your assessment data instead of writing your big reports. So I joke we're sort of between your gym, a spa, and a mechanic for your brain. <laughs> you can come in and like, you know, check it out and learn about it. And we'll teach you about your speed of processing and your impulsivity and your lack of deep sleep and, and give you some life coaching stuff to address uh, your brain but also give you, if you want, heavy duty uh, tools to then make really large changes rapidly, things like neurofeedback, which can, you know, in a matter of months, make multiple standard deviations of change in, in most assessed scores. So it's pretty big stuff. So long-winded, but I'm now an evangelist for neurofeedback because you, know, you have the ability to make your brain change and you might as well take control of it, essentially. So how does this practically work? So I come, up, yeah. I come along to one of your clinics. I'm feeling sad. Yeah. So I walk in the door. What happens then? You have some goals for changing how you feel or how you perform, right? And we would say, great, let's start with the brain map and let's assess your executive function. So for about an hour, we would do stuff to you. We would have you sit at a computer screen and be bored to tears for about, about half an hour and click on a mouse button for a one that popped up and ignore a two that popped up and make it really boring. So you start becoming inattentive and, and impulsive and look and see the ways in which your executive function frays. Does it fray with impulsivity or with an intention? Is it auditory? Is it visual? Is it short-term? Is it long-term? Is it metacognitive? Is it reactive? And tease apart where the biggest bottlenecks probably are for you. And when we look at the bottlenecks, we're looking at a population comparison. So you compared to other people your age. The average, you know, how has been different than the average person who's about 35 years old mm -hmm. or whatever. So then we also do brain mapping, which is called a cute EEG or a quantitative EEG. So we stick a cap on your head, we squirt it full of gel, we sit still for about 10 minutes, and we record baseline brain activity, the amount of brain waves, the distribution across the head and the connectivity patterns, how fast they are. And we take all that data and compare it to a normative database of a few thousand people and see how weird you are. And then look at the bell curve and say, okay, here's a thing that's unusual. It's true. And for some people, hypothesis, it can mean X. You're like, oh, yeah, that's, that's me. Okay, great. The X is probably true. And there are some things that are almost diagnostically valid, like the ratio of your theta to beta brain waves, the amount of theta brain waves, which is like receptive attention, and beta brain waves, which is a linear focus. Um, when that ratio is high, especially in kids, the brain maps will able to spot ADHD 94% of the time, high impulsivity, the, there's air in the brake lines of your mind, uh, essentially. And so you can't pump the brakes, you're reactive and squirrel when you have high theta beta ratios. 
Um, or in adults, if you, if I look at your brain, I show that your alpha waves, which is a resting idling frequency, if your alpha waves are running slow compared to your age, then I know you're experiencing a sluggish speed of processing. Maybe it's pro provoking symptoms like delayed recall or word finding issues in the afternoon when you're tired. For you, that would kill you as a, as a podcast host. But if you, <laughs> if speed of, people often come in complaining of memory issues, and you dig in, it's word finding issues in the afternoon. That's a basic performance thing. The biggest performance things you, have, you, you, uh, you feel are working memory and speed of processing. Those mm -hmm. are the big ones. And you can't really change either with conventional tools. You, know, you can't do dual end back really and change your working memory. If you could, you know, that's the big intelligence booster. But speed of processing is how you load up your working memory, and that's the big pinch you often feel. So as elders get a little bit slower in their alpha waves, their internal speed of processing, you get this delayed recall thing happening or hunting for words, verbal fluency stuff in the afternoon, mm. especially. Or with concussions all the time, this delayed recall for reaching for memories. So again, I wouldn't say diagnostically, oh, hey, this is true for you. I'd say, oh, look, uh, your alpha waves are slower than average. For many people, this can produce a speed of processing in, uh, issue. Are you experiencing some, some hitch, some uh, difficulty with delayed recall in the afternoon? Oh, you are. Great. There it is. So we go through 10, 20, 30 different features in your brain maps and your attention test and figure out where the biggest bottlenecks likely are. And really, you're making the meaning. I'm just teaching you to sort of navigate what is possibly true, and then you extract the, oh, yeah, that's important to me. It's kind of like, again, walking to a gym and going, you know, uh, here's the fitness data, and they go, okay, a little bit of, you know, left side strong on your right side, and you can use that core strength, and you hear that and go, abs, yes, great. Here's your, here's your big target now. We'll start with your abs and, you know. But, of course, you guys as, as wellness people know that you don't just work on your abs. You work on the whole system to get abs, including sleep and diet and nutrition. So if you come in and say, I want creativity, great. I can reliably boost creative access and flow state. No problem. That's super easy to do. And your T cells will probably go up at the same time, oddly enough. But if you're anxious and I crack you open into generative flow state and ide ideation and, gener and generative, you know, real access consciousness stuff, well, if you're traumatized or anxious, guess what comes up? I mean, just all that stuff. So my job as a coach, not as a doctor, but as a coach is to say, okay, look, I see some anxiety markers, the posterior cingulate, you know, the evaluated environment is kind of lit up. For many people, that means you're kind of ruminating, kind of threat sensitive. Is that true for you? Oh, it is? All right. I know you want creativity, but my suggestion is best practices, we kind of unclench the threat detector and then make you juicy and wide open because that might feel better. And we work with our clients to, to generate that strategy, that like individualized mix of regulatory resources you want to work on, sleep, stress, mood, attention, creativity, as well as any symptom-driven stuff, which is often like post-concussive stuff or PTSD or OCD or you know, developmental trauma or alcoholism or you know, depression or anxiety or a, a bunch of other stuff, ticks, all kinds of things respond really well. Anything regulatory, things that all brains do every day, and when they fail, you know, that's easy stuff to put back on track, actually. So stress response stuff, anxiety and attention are natural features that are a bit dysregulated when they're getting away. And those things generally are the, the lowest hanging fruit to uh, re-regulate, if you will. So to operationalize it, to answer your question, Ben, after we got a sense of what you wanted to work on, let's say we found your theta-beta ratio was high and you had a lot of impulsivity, uh, squirrel on on attention tests, we would say, oh, okay, it looks like you're a little impulsive, um, you know, standard deviation below average. This might get in the way. What do you think? I'll work on this? All right, cool. Let's get you rock solid in your laser-like focus and self-control. So I'd measure your theta and beta brain waves, probably on a region of the brain involved with supervising your attention, knowing if you're paying attention. And I would measure your theta and beta moment to moment. And it's going to change all by itself a little bit, and a little more, a little less, a little more, a little less. And whenever your theta briefly drifted down and your beta briefly drifted up for half a second on its own, we'd go, yay, good job, brain, with more audio and visual feedback. So it's a spaceship flies faster, a pack many more dots, a car hits more zombies, um, music gets louder. And the next moment, your brain moves in the quote unquote wrong direction and we withhold the feedback, stuff goes away. The brain's like, hey, wait, I, I, was, I was watching that car. And the brain happens to move in the right direction again. The software goes, yep, good job. Nope, yep, nope, yep. And the brain learns from that, and then it starts to chase whatever's producing the input. And the trick here is we move the goalposts every few seconds. We adapt. We, we encourage the brain to like chase uh, like a drop in theta, let's say. And you have a very subtle or maybe no experience of that in the session. It's involuntary. Mm -hmm. We're just kind of pointing on, hey, yeah, good job. Do more of that. And whenever it happens to a little bit of that, the brain's like, ooh, that was interesting. That stuff happened. 
but then tomorrow your brain will do a little more of what produced the increase in stuff. It's, it's trying to get a sense of how to control that information or that signal. Mm. And so it leans into it tomorrow or tonight or the next day. And you feel very subtly different. What does it feel like to have lower theta or unclench those cingulates that are stuck in this evaluation? What does that feel like? A little gentle, you know, push. And the next day you swing back to where you were. But if it felt good, improved your sleep, your executive function, your focus, mm -hmm. you know, get a subtle sense, try it again. Push yourself up again, like a workout. Keep getting more and more. And eventually after a dozen sessions or so, your brain can now regulate those things on its own. And you have much more reliable access to it every day. And you can, you know, then you can go after different resources, stress and sleep and mood and creativity and all kinds of stuff, almost like you're dialing up a menu of workouts. So kind of fun. How does it work with somebody that's suffering from depression? Yeah. Depression's a bit of a harder one. Um, depression's really a human experience of other stuff. You don't see a depression resource in the brain. If I look at a brain map, depression's not one of those things I reliably see as a big feature in your brain because it could be a bunch of other things that you're experiencing as uh, depression. Like I often see anxiety features, but people aren't experiencing anxiety, they're experiencing depression. Or I see a lot of deep sleep issues and experience depression. Or I see slowed processing in the brain and they're experiencing depression. There is a classic depression feature in the QEEG called frontal asymmetry that's actually based largely on the work of Richie Davidson, a meditation scientist um, who looked at monks and found that they have a frontal activation that's left dominant and not right dominant. If you're in a joyful approach mode and if you're in a, an avoid mode, it's the other way around. And so if I saw a pattern in your brain that was frontal asymmetry, you know, too much alpha in the left front, too much beta in the right front, I would say, oh, Ben, you know, not a great marker, but maybe a third of the time when this shows up, there's some, you know, trait of depression. How do you have some history of depression? If you're like, yeah, actually, that, I am. I'd be like, all right, well, this might be relevant. Not sure. Let's see what happens if we exercise that ratio in the other direction. How do you feel? If you're like, ooh, that, I got a nice mood lift. I felt resilient. I felt buoyant. Great. That, you're apparently one of those unusual people that has frontal reversed asymmetry that's relevant. Let's try that. Otherwise, I would work on everything and get you sleeping better drop the reactivity of the stress response. And if you had significant depression, I'm, you know, Peak Brain, my company is not the place to work because we're more of a fitness and performance driven. Uh, then when I talk about their brain and I confirm some of the flavors of depression, if we discover they're suicidal or something, I'd be like, yeah, I'm sorry, experiencing this. And who is your therapist? And let's get them involved and I'll work with them and you. Or, oh, you don't have somebody in this, you know, cute psychiatric therapeutic mode. You, you probably need somebody. Ethically, I'm not your guy here. It's not responsible. You need more than I can, I can serve for you here. So let's get somebody else involved or, you know, I'll help you get your brain out of the way, but you might need more work. It's not just about the brain resource. It's also about the learning the experiences and all kinds of other things. And so I think there's a room for like the coach in the gym, making you bang out the big resources, and the coach in the field, helping you with the technique. And the therapist is the technique or the meditation teacher is the technique or the priest or the guru. The person helping you navigate and integrate the internal environment and learn to use new skills and, and transform that's interesting and important. I want to work one level below that and help you get your brain out of the way or take control of it or understand it because I'm not satisfied if you have ADHD and you don't want to have it or you have seizures or you have some trauma. You know, I want you to think about this like the same way you would like a, a sore shoulder because it's separated. You know, you have, you have a PTSD response because your posterior cingulate learned the world wasn't safe or predictable for a few years. Now your brain's doing this all the time and is threat sensitive and looking for danger. Okay really similar to like working out too hard or having a car accident and separating your shoulder, having a twinge for the next three months, really similar phenomena. It's, it's reacting. It's an injury. And if you look at your brain that way, sometimes it's just the agency alone of going, Oh, it's my brain can give you a sense of control. And then the idea that you can actually literally just change those resources in a few months gives you the, the other piece of control essentially. So it works adequately for depression to answer your question, but the agency itself can sometimes add a lot to the whole process. For I don't know if this is the right terminology, so forgive me if this isn't. Do you do a pre and post scan to look at the brainwave coherency? Lots of things. The coherence, which is connectivity, but also the, the amounts of brainwaves, also the speeds of pattern, just for fun, since we're on Zoom. I'm not sure if your listeners will see this, but I just shared with you a set of pre-post yeah. maps. I was going to ask if it looked like um, this. So, Yeah, and, and these are brain maps, and these are actually four different people. I usually end up with a couple hundred pages of data when I do your brain map, but I've clipped together different things you can see, and I have a bell curve here 
this color bar is a bell curve because everything in brain mapping or really psychology is about how unusual are you. So we're looking for things that are in the corners of the bell curve and saying, where are things that are unusual? So you see a guy here at the top of the screen with lots of beta waves, all these red blobs everywhere and low amounts of delta waves and theta waves for blue blobs. And then the connectivity or coherence of these lines, overconnected in beta, underconnected in, in, in the slow brain waves. This is a classic burnt dead alcoholic. And this gentleman was 25 years, a bottle and a half of wine and out of van and an ambient to go to sleep. You know, all day long drank, just chronically. Could not fall asleep ever. I mean, it was shaky, nervous, burnt out. And this brain on the left is him 45 days sober. This is not a drunk brain. It's a brain that is damaged through chronic drinking. And that's him on the right, you know, almost perfectly clean beta waves and all the coherence. So the guy became able to fall asleep at will whenever he wanted to, instead of the shaky, nervous, couldn't fall asleep alcoholic. So, you know, you see a lot of pre-posts, ADHD and, and OCD here at the bottom, a lot of anxiety, the back of the head slid up and anxiety often. So these kind of changes that you can see in the screen are three to four standard deviations for many people. And these are not cherry picked. This is standard amount of change in, you know, three, four months of training. So I used to do about 30 sessions. Now I do about 40 and I map in the middle. So I do about 40 to 50 sessions uh, as a first chunk of training. If you have injuries or lots of stuff going on, you know, 50 is a good starting place. And if you have just some ADHD or anxiety or something, then, you know, 40 is a good starting place. So three to four months of training, three times a week for half an hour, and you get to iterate through brain changes. And then we map your brain again and show your attention performance again, periodically. And you get more and more control over it. The same way you would for personal training. You go into a weigh-in every few months or test your sport performance every few months and look at the performance metrics you care about and then go after new things in your fitness regimen to address new performance goals or to, to chase the same ones. And so this is why we don't charge you for repeat brain maps. It's a one-time fee so you can have the control, so you can have the agency. It's not so we can tell you what to do. You know, it's not a report saying, here's what's wrong with you. It's a, it's a data set saying, it's a Zoom call saying, hey, let's go over some data and teach you to read it and uh, make sure you can digest this at, at your leisure. So, Just to be clear and make sure I've got it and also the audience have got it. So where we're in high beta on the left-hand side where it's red. Yeah. So that's yeah. somebody who's, you were saying, was drinking, but an incoherence in terms of their brainwave frequency. They might be stressed. And then if yeah, we... a lot of anxiety, a lot of distractibility, a lot of scattered brain, a lot of like shakiness physically and an inability to, to turn their brain off and fall asleep at will. And he would go two, three weeks in a row without sleeping until he was heavily medicated or drunk because he was so chronically over aroused in the absence of alcohol. And then we go to green. So there's coherence there in terms of changing the brainwave frequency, but the person's more coherent, so the less stress. Yeah, we dropped the beta waves, which were overproduced. Beta's like a gas pedal in the brain. They're overproduced uh, chronically from three plus standard deviations above average to typical, roughly the, the lighter green. And then the coherence of the lines or connectivity or shared information of those lines. And he went from three standard deviations over connected. So like not varying moment to moment in the thinking frequency, just like buzz, a high frequency buzz almost internally to having typical, if you will, connectivity or coherence in these green heads. It means you're just toward the middle of the bell curve. And then when it's blue heads, you have low amounts of something. When it's red, it's super high amounts of something. So he went from trouble deeply resting and super over aroused and couldn't change gears into could fall asleep, could change gears, still kind of burnt out. I mean, the Delta means he still wasn't sleeping great at that point, but we kept working with him for a little while longer. Is a good day in the office where they're all green or does it need to be? No, green? it's just training you towards your goals. I mean, when I do a brain map on you 20, 30 sessions after your first brain map, the first repeat, I expect to see a solid standard deviation of change for the better. And I expect to have been hearing from you for several weeks, how amazing your sleep is and your stress is, and whatever else you wanna work on. Like it's finally starting to shift for you. And that's powerful. Like two weeks in when things start to actually start to change, the next month of change, when your ADHD is changing, your stress response, your sleep, your seizures, your migraines, or, that's powerful because it hasn't changed for you really, probably historically. And you're reporting in lots of things. We go back and map the brain and go, great, let's see what we can see about what's changed and learn from the maps, refocus, figure out what's important to focus in the next 20 sessions, and then do another round of that and push your brain further. So each time you map your brain, you're getting more and more sense of control, but you're making the meaning. I'm just going, how do you feel? What sure. happened after we tried this workout? Was it too hard? Was it too easy? Did it improve your sleep? Did it worsen your sleep? And I have lots of theories about the, what this means until we start doing the training. And then I listen to what you say and learn from that and iterate. So it's a mix of the art and the science of kind of 
you know, pushing the brain around in that way. And where you've put um, average of 30 sessions. Yeah. What time period is that over? Three times a week. Okay. But many people will take weeks off and it doesn't matter. The brain remembers way better than the body does. I typically now do more like 40 session minimums, three month programs, three times a week, half an hour, nap in the middle of that. So you get at least three maps. And people often drop a week or two of pause in there, here and there. It's fine. It, it, it acts exactly the same long term as the, what is if you trained uninterrupted. And then my peak performers often train, you know, for six months or a year and just keep cranking on resources. You know, a lot of executives will just, you know, do a, a couple of months, like, like two to four months of acute training to knock down. Often executives have a mix of really high performance stuff. And to some extent, stuff that's fraying because of their high performance or their performance lifestyle. Like they are really effective at work, but get home and yell at their kids or their wife because they have no patience or they don't sleep well. You find there's a mix of both good and bad. And so those people will often do really lovely, you know, resolution of stress, sleep, attention problems in a few months, and then keep training lower intensity to just keep leveling up their resources. And so you can get well above your baseline. Like we don't, we aren't training you to the average here. We aren't looking at why you are an average. We don't care why you are an average. We just care if the things here that we're finding for you are relevant. So it's not a question of how you know, good or bad you are, it's a question of how unusual you are, and can we be informed by that in a way that gets you further in your goals? And we usually can, which is kind of nice, so. And with this gentleman that you said was drinking, did it have an impact in terms of his dependency in terms of alcohol? It did. He was an unusual alcoholic in that he didn't have a lot of lifestyle impacts from his alcoholism. He was a writer. And he would sit on the beach and write on his laptop for years with a bottle of wine next to him. And it was a very low key amount of drinking, but just chronic all the time. So he'd go through about a bottle, a bottle and a half of wine every single day from 2 p.m. until about 6 p.m., 8 p.m. And then he would take medication to fall asleep. For years of that, I met him, you know, six foot five, bright orange, oompa loompa looking man, you know, a massive liver failure, uh, really, really giant orange man who was just was on the edge of death but he's somebody who had no problem resisting alcohol at will it was such low key amounts of drinking for so many years he was dependent on it so in the absence of alcohol he would literally not sleep for five days eight days nine days and get a bit psychotic because of that and get in trouble or he would go many days without, without sleeping and take a bunch of Ambien out of van and wake up like wandering around his neighborhood like having fallen down his stairs bleeding and looking kind of weird and crazy and get you know picked up by the police but it was just years of low-key drinking so he wasn't seeking alcohol he had no real problems in his resisting the behavior if he could fall asleep and so with this guy we happened to unlock his sleep very rapidly and that was kind of all he needed and he had no problems just kind of being abstinent at will and i've worked with other people like this who had no problems being moderate after their drinking and got under their control you know the biggest part of moderation is about dropping your tolerance and the reasons you're using this guy was sober during the training, but he didn't mm. go back to drinking. Other folks have gone back to drinking successfully and find they are less impulsive, less anxious, mm. not using to fall asleep, mm. or to dull their emotions because they're comfortable now with their internal mm. environments. And then it pulls the teeth of other things indirectly. It's like working at the gym. If you went to the gym for three or four weeks or five weeks for your first time, it's suddenly affecting your balance and your sleep and how, how awesome your sex is. You're like, I didn't go to the gym for these things. I went to the gym for my, my belly fat. But all kinds of things are changing. That's what happens in brain training because it literally is top down in, in your experience. Andrew, Ben and I work with a lot of executives and I think I can see how this could work wonders for execs. But as soon as you mentioned the words autism and ADHD, mm -hmm. something went off in my mind around, I speak to so many parents, so many mums and dads mm. that mm. I don't know what's happening in the world now, but it seems as though ADHD mm. and autism is becoming either a bigger problem or it's being diagnosed more. Yeah. But how effective is this with children? It's profoundly effective. Basically, it works if you have a brain. It works whether or not you want it to. I have plenty of teenagers in my office who don't want to be there and they have their ADHD addressed anyways. For ADHD, we almost always eliminate it. It's just like a linear process because ADHD is not a disease process. It's just like a tuning. It's hunters versus gatherers, you know? And some of us are stuck in one mode or the other mm. and rely on the environment. The ADHD kid can hyper-focus playing a video game, generally. Can't find that same focus for 20 minutes in a low stimulus environment because they're relying on the environment to cue what mode they're in. By the same token, ADHD kids will, will teach their parents to fight with them because the act of conflict creates that sharp executive 
engagement the same way what a video game would or a fight would or, or a, you know, a, a foxhole. So the ADHD brain is tuned preferentially to be in this sort of on mode and synthetic pattern matching and novelty seeking because it, it's, it's evolutionarily advantageous across a range of possible life. It really doesn't fit cubicle life that much at all. And the problem with ADHD is you're stuck in a mode. You have amazing, I mean, above average ability to focus, you know, all these guys under high stimulus, mm. much less so than average or low stimulus. So the, the video game is great or the, the stock floor, stock room trading floor is great, <laughs> but the boardroom is not, the classroom is not. And that's a big conflict for performance. So in ADHD, you just get executive function uh, inhibitory tone. You train the brain to be able to shift gears. So you don't lose your hyper-focus or your creativity or your pattern matching or your ability to be, play Fortnite better than everyone else. But you don't have to be in that mode. You can also decide to put down the video game, come to dinner or, you know, sit in the boardroom and stop doodling. You can decide you should focus and that resource comes up the same way it would if you were highly stimulated. It's very nice. In the case of autism, you're not working on the autism. There's no autism brain. There's, there's a bunch of things. And yes, ADHD, I would argue, is not come up an incident, just an awareness, and it's being overdiagnosed. Autism is going way, way up. We don't know what it is. We know a bunch of things it isn't. But autism seems to be a developmental trajectory gone awry for a bunch of accumulating factors. We don't know why. But in the autistic brain, of course, there's many different things. You, know, you get 10 people in a room with autism, you got 11 different you know, types of brains there, basically. You'll get some commonalities. You'll get some sensory integration, some perseveration, some rumination, some social and sensory difficulties, eye contact, some seizure disorders, if they're more acute, you'll get a, a cluster of individual brain dysregulations, those you can go after. Oh, you ruminate? Oh, you're obsessive and, and, and your kid doesn't let you push the buttons on the microwave because they're a little OCD autistic kid? That stuff's tractable. No eye contact? You're aspie with no sense of humor? That stuff's easy. But, you know, it's a different trajectory of change. If I took you guys, you sort out your sleep, your stress, your mood, your tension, and then crank it all up as far as you want in flow states with a spectrum kid who's high, you know, no eye contact and high pitch whining and rocking back and forth, like soothing the sensory system, you know, little language production, some eye contact is a massive change. And parents are very, very happy when their kid like stops having seizures, you know, more than mm. once a month instead of three times a night or makes a little eye contact out of nowhere or, mm. you know, has subtle reductions in sensory issues. Those things make a big difference in a chronic, you know, person with big issues. But easy issues, you know, are things like ADHD, anxiety, all the stuff that all brains do, but they can get stuck or tuned in a certain way that aren't always in your control. Even severe versions of that, PTSD, OCD, developmental trauma, acute trauma, those things are actually some of the lowest hanging fruit in neurofeedback because you get little circuits that spin up that a circuit in the back of the posterior cingulate. Um, and it ramps up when you learn the world isn't safe. You know, it's an evaluator. And you need this circuit. If you're driving your car, not that you would do this in the UK because it's illegal, but if you're driving your car and you're on the phone and you drop your phone, you're fishing for it, there's a sense of, oh, watch the road. That's the posterior cingulate watching the environment and your behavior and throwing a flag in the play when things are in conflict. You need that. But if you learn the world is not predictable or safe, the brain's like, all right, where's that tiger? And you're like, brain, I'm in the bath. Yeah, but are there water tigers? I'm reading a book. Are there, is this a book about tigers? <laughs> brain, come on. Like, and you end up almost like unreasonably navigating senses of stress and fear because of stuck circuits for evaluation or selection of what you're focusing on, which is this guy here at the classic perseverative, the front midline hotspot of beta, the anterior cingulate. That decides what you should focus on. And you use that for all kinds of lovely things like, ooh, I love this person. That obsessive thought of value. Or is the oven on? Wait, is the oven on? or biting your nails, or a song in your head. You, know, it can, you can use it or it can use you. So I joke sometimes the OCD marker is the same as the CEO marker. Doesn't mean it's a problem per se, but if it's there, I'll be like, oh, do you perseverate? Do you get stuck? You do? Okay, is it in the way? So be like, oh, it is. All right, let's unstick it so you can ramp it up to 12 when you want to and let it go to two when you don't want to. Because right now it's at, a, it's at a nine and isn't comfortable or flexible. Let's get rid of that so you can use it as much as you want or as little as you want instead of sitting there stressing about your payroll at 9 p.m. at night, you know, you can let that go, for instance. But what does neurofeedback and mindfulness meditation have in common? 
Well, they're both big plasticity boosters. And there's good research showing that one single session of neurofeedback causes a measurable shift in plasticity in the brain. It's very large. If you do neurofeedback and you do other stuff, especially classic neurofeedback, which is called SMR, this plasticity training. If you do SMR training and other stuff, it all works better. So language learning, physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychiatric therapy, your brain gets more plastic and everything starts to change. So you have this freedom to work on the whole system as well as to be targeted. So what I find is in general, people who are doing meditation and neurofeedback both experience change in those things faster than doing neurofeedback or meditation alone. I find meditation is a directed, again, voluntary way of changing your brain and neurofeedback is involuntary and broad. There is something you can do in neurofeedback that would replicate meditative states and doing some types of neurofeedback will support deeper meditation states over time. But then there's another thousand things you can do in neurofeedback that have no bearing whatsoever on meditation and are simply a broad, you know, it's kind of like saying, you know, what's the similarity, you know, basketball, you know, jump shot practice to working out at the gym. Well, you can absolutely do things in the gym that will give you better jump shot. Ago, there were no fitness centers. 80 years ago, there was no fitness centers, there was mm -hmm. no gyms, you know, there were retreats, there were the Kellogg Center, you go in the sanitariums and things, but there weren't fitness centers. That was multi-billion dollar industries of high-end gyms where you go and learn to work out and practice working out. So I think we need this perspective on brain stuff from it being blind, having no agency. It's, you know, it's just stuff that happens to us, to learning about it, taking control of it. And to a large extent, it is very tractable you have control shift happens so you know get yours how permanent is the work so if, if i mm -hmm. i did this three times a week over a prolonged period mm -hmm. is that it or do people have to come back it usually takes at least 40 sessions for a permanent change so i will do uh, some very large change in 30 to 40 sessions but generally once you've hit that kind of time scale anything you've accomplished with the training will become longer lasting. And some things are very quick to permanize. Generally the things that all brains do, attention, sleep, and stress. If you fix your ADHD or your PTSD mm. or your you know, sleep maintenance issue, those things are being practiced by your brain every day. And so once you do enough training, they tend to stay changed. There's lots of research in ADHD, lots. And there's tons of studies showing at six months, 12 months, five years, 10 years, that people have good stable change. I don't want to tell you what you experience. I just want to give you agency. So we just provide brain mapping and attention testing for free for you for life. So if you're feeling off, come check if it's stuff is worn off. Probably not. People do about three to six months generally for, the, for these executive functions, stress, sleep, uh, injuries take about that minimum, about four to six months minimum concussion stuff. Um, and then my peak performers will often train longer. It's kind of a hard question to answer about permanence because people do train such a long time with us. And mm. we also have a model of doing home training. So a lot of my clients, you know, 40% or something will get equipment and train from home. And the cost structure is very different, very open-ended to just keep training with, with no ongoing mm -hmm. costs. So people do these intense four-month programs to have most of their needs met and then are sent off, you know, on journeys of transformation, you know, largely on their own. We support them what they need. And then you can map your brain and keep getting more sense of what's changing. So I'm not exactly a traditional treatment-driven guy where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, ADHD is four months and trauma is four three months and you know sure that's kind of it's like a three to six month process but people often train with me for much longer who are the peak performers because they're just chasing you know more and more access consciousness and creativity and other stuff like that so are there any examples of people certainly within the executive space that stand out in terms of before and after from a results point of view well i mean i've worked a lot with ben greenfield talks about his uh, experience with us quite freely so I can do that. I'm, I, you know, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not bound by those medical rules. I am still bound ethically by the same privacy rule. I wouldn't show your, your data, uh, Ben, if you show me your brain, it's, it's yours. But um, Ben's talked about it and Ben's shown that he had, you know, a lot of fog and fatigue and concussion stuff. And, you know, after a few months of training had much better performance. Um, but, you know, I have a lot of these higher level executive types, you know, athletes. Um, I've worked a lot with Olympic type athletes and super high performers. A friend of mine named Brian McKenzie, who is a, a breath work guy, Art of Breath and XPT. Brian fell and broke his neck um, not too long ago. Uh, he fell on his head and broke his neck. And he called me, because I've been working with his brain off and on for attention stuff. And he's like, oh, I just broke my neck. I'm like, oh man, why did you do that? You know? But we got him a set of neurofeedback equipment simply to accelerate his recovery. Mm. Pain protocols and plasticity, so he rebounded faster. 
So some of my executives and long-term performers will simply use this as an adjunctive tool against other interventions because it seems to accelerate uh, with plasticity. Say about, um, uh, about a third of my clients are these highest performers in the world types, you know, a mix of executives and athletes, many times are both. And then about a third of my clients are the really extremely poor performers, the most big impairments, kids with autism, seizures, migraines, people have had car accidents or major concussions. And then there's the rest of us who aren't, you know, who have classic stuff and sleep, stress, mood, attention, and want some support and optimization. But, but yeah, the executives, as I was saying earlier, they often come in with one or two particular bottlenecks. And How can people reach out to you or your company? Yeah, so we're Peak Brain Institute. We're uh, mostly Peak Brain LA on socials, but of course, I think we're also Peak Brain Institute. And we're all over the world I'm in different countries, mostly in the US. We have a very small branch in London, uh, in Chelsea. We have some services in Scandinavian countries as well. And we're growing, as I said, a lot of my clients train themselves. We're doing these, these workshops. So check us out on Peak Brain LA on Twitter and Instagram. You can get in touch with us on the website, peakbraininstitute.com. as a chat box with my senior staff. We'll monitor it and answer your brain questions if you have them. Uh, and then all our big offices have free brain talks every month. So in Los Angeles and St. Louis, which are the two big flagships in the U.S., we have monthly talks. We have free mindfulness groups three, four times a week in these offices. You can come and practice with no charge at all and just get some support with really great teachers. So again, we're a gym, a spa, and a mechanic for you. If we can support your brain journey in some way, either by assessing you and giving you some sense of agency or working over many months to help you transform, uh, get in touch. We'd love to do that. Great stuff. And finally, what would you say your top three tips are for executives who are looking to upgrade their personal and yeah. professional performance? Always starts with the things you're doing every day. You're always sleeping. You're always eating. You know, you're always stressing. So managing your day-to-day -day basic habits that you have to do, you have to eat, you have to sleep generally. So dial those in first. And the biggest lever, the biggest exogenous cue for circadian entrainment is not light uh, to the chagrin of most biohackers. It's food. It's when you eat. So the most important thing for circadian, to protect your circadian rhythm is to not eat at night. So generally find that executives are snacking late at night or drinking late at night and they're throwing off circadian rhythm, especially once you're north of like about 35, you aren't getting much in the way of growth hormone released after you fall asleep. And, it, and if you have any insulin in your system, you get none released. So you need to have low insulin falling asleep. So I recommend people fast for at least three hours before bed as the number one circadian support. Number two, wake up the same time every day. I don't care when you go to bed, I care when you wake up because morning light is the only important light really. And then exercise in the morning before you eat at least a few times a week. And if you're fat adapted, you'll burn six times as much adipose by working out in the morning before you eat than at the end of the day. So a little, a little bribery there for your waistline. Mm -hmm. But those are much stronger cues in terms of circadian control than blue blocking light and screens at night and anything else. So I care about the big things first. Don't eat at night. Wake up consistently seven days a week, roughly the same time. And then exercise in the morning before you eat. Those are huge in terms of circadian support. And then beyond that, well, what isn't working for you? You know, the next easiest things are, are controlling your food as well. So don't eat, you know, do some time restricted feeding or some longer fast and work on some autophagy and learn what it feels like to resensitize your insulin. Those are easy things to do. And then there's cheap things. Get a sauna or join a sauna, you know, a club or something and do a lot of sauna. It reduces total cause death in a huge amount. If you have all the resources as a successful entrepreneur, get a hyperbaric chamber. That also reduces total cause death by a huge amount and do a lot of hyperbaric dives, you know, every day. There's lots of things you can do, but it's a question of like the things you're always doing and then gradually chasing more and more things with more and more resources. Just fix the stuff you're doing wrong right now that you have to do every day. The crap you eat, when you eat, and how you're sleeping. Start there, because almost everyone who's a high performer has something they can improve in how they eat or how they sleep. Sure. Start there. Thank you so much, Andrew. My pleasure. Thanks, Andrew. That was awesome. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. I'd like to thank Dr. Andrew Hill for his time and insights. Do check out Andrew on his social channels. As a friendly reminder, do visit www.upgradedexecutive.com forward slash subscribe, and we will send you a special link so you can access the videos one week before we officially release them.